All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing well. We will begin the, the presentation in just a minute or so. We'll let a, a couple other people log on. Uh, All right, I will start the introductions if that's okay with you, Julie. Yeah, totally. All right, sounds good. Um, so again, welcome everyone, uh, those online and in person. Um, I will, um, I'm Brielle, and I'm one of the organizers of this year's quantitative seminar series for the Converse Lab. And I'll begin by acknowledging the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And we also acknowledge that we live and work on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. So I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Julie Blackwood. Julie graduated from the University of California, Davis, with a PhD in applied mathematics, working under the supervision of Alan Hastings. And she went on to complete a postdoc at the University of Michigan in ecology and evolutionary biology, working with Paj Rouhani. And she has been at Williams College in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics since 2013. So thanks again, Julie, for um, being willing to present today and you can take it away. Awesome, yeah, thank you for inviting me. And now that I've learned it's your last day of classes, I'm impressed that anyone showed up. Um, so happy end of the semester. And today I'm actually gonna talk about a few different projects. And what I wanna do is sort of start with a couple of motivating projects that I did earlier in my career that has kind of led me to what I'm thinking about now, which is this piece about managing ecosystems under multiple administrative administrative jurisdictions. So let me see if I get this working. There we go. So the the two systems that I'm going to talk about initially um, are first coral reefs. So uh, this picture on the left. Can you see my mouse? I'll assume that's a yes. Um, so this is a picture of coral reef ecosystem, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, but these are sea urchins, which essentially uh, graze macroalgae or algaes on the, the coral reef and kind of keep them uh, healthy and, and um, prevent overgrowth by algae, which would essentially suffocate and kill them. And then this picture on the right, I also study infectious diseases, and so this is a picture of a vampire bat, and I'll talk a bit about rabies and vampire bats. The, the underlying theme of all of the work that I really do is, is this general kind of big picture question of how can we effectively manage these ecosystems? And so in the case of the coral reef, I'm thinking about conservation efforts and I'll show how that, um, the way I think about it, it's really tied to fisheries management. And then in the case of the, the disease, I'm really thinking about how do we minimize disease transmission or how do we minimize the overall number of cases? So these are kind of the two motivating questions I'm gonna ask. And one thing I want to highlight for both of them, which has motivated my, my later work, is when I look at these systems, space is always implicit. And so in other words, if I'm thinking about management, I'm really thinking about a uniform type of management over space. I'm not thinking about how there might be um, trade-offs based on, on the spatial structure and who manages what. So once I talk about these two systems, I'll then kind of get into that work. Also, I apologize, I'm a little sick, so I'm scratching. I'm sorry if I start coughing in the middle of things. Um, but the, the big picture of this, and the reason that I've started to think about space more broadly, is that when you think about management of ecosystems, it doesn't necessarily obey political boundaries. So this is a picture of the United States, where rather than dividing it up based on state boundaries, it's divided based on kind of geographically distinct regions. And so with ecosystems, if you're thinking about um, invasive insects uh, or diseases or fisheries, they don't necessarily 
obey kind of the, the political lines of where policy is being put in place. So this is sort of what I'm building up to. And the, the third part of the talk, once I get through these, will be to talk about exactly that and how we could consider that kind of explicitly with modeling. So coral reef management, kind of get going with this one. Here's a picture of a, a healthy reef. The reefs that I studied uh, were mostly in the Caribbean. And so about 9% of the world's reefs are in the Caribbean. They are important for a lot of reasons. Um, ecosystem services, such as hurricane defense, they support a lot of biodiversity and so on. And they're also important economically. So they generate $3 billion annually for things such as tourism and uh, fisheries and, and so on. So they're important both ecologically and economically. If you haven't heard this story before, before 1983, there were these urchins that uh, covered the reefs. And what they did was, <coughs> excuse me, um, graze on the macroalgae. So these algaes that grow on the reef, they, they graze it, kind of keep it in check in a way that it doesn't actually overgrow the reef and ultimately suffocate them. So the, the urchins were important for this function. In 1983 to 1984, there was a mass mortality event. So there was a disease that killed off more than 99% of the urchins, which left things a bit in trouble because they were the primary grazers of the algae and the reefs. And what happened is there's a picture of an urchin on the left and on the right is a parrotfish. So herbivorous fish became the primary grazers. And in particular, the parrotfish was sort of the most dominant, is the most dominant uh, grazer on reefs. And so the work that I was involved in, this started back when I was a, a grad student um, at Davis, was thinking about how we can manage the, the coral reef ecosystem in terms of thinking about grazing patterns of the fish. So this is a picture of a parrotfish being caught in a net. They're subject to overfishing. And so it really becomes connected to a fisheries question of how much can we fish and still sustain um, the ecosystem health. So here's a, a just picture of a reef that's been kind of decimated by algae. Um, here's another picture of a really unhealthy habitat where you can see the fishnet that's just sort of laying on the ground um, and it's pretty barren. And here's just an article from a few years ago. Uh, it says Caribbean coral reefs will be lost within 20 years without protection. And it says a major report warns that loss of grazing fish due to pollution and overfishing is a key driver of co region's coral decline. And so what my graduate work really looked at is this question of overfishing and uh, can we, can we um, put fishing regulations in place so that we preserve the reef? And then just one more, I think this is the last picture I show, uh, of the reefs um, several years ago. And you could see where all the red lines are. Those are um, indicated as high risk of uh, reef mortality. And only about one sixth of the original cover remains from when the urchins died off. So pretty kind of dramatic decline in reef cover. So the questions we wanted to get at are one, what grazing levels are required to sustain healthy reefs? And two, can fishing regulations alone lead to coral recovery? It's a big question. There's a lot of different factors in it, but essentially from our perspective, we wanted to first look at a mathematical model that looks at just the essential interactions between coral and algae. So what are the key parts of the system that'll model the, the dynamics between coral and algae? And then think about equilibria, fixed points, um, and how grazing plays a role in this. So what grazing levels will help us get us to a, a stable state where there's high coral cover? And then lastly, think about fishing dynamics explicitly. So, the model that we did, um, as we all said, uh, my background, I'm trained in applied math, but I've spent a, a fair amount of time in ecology evolutionary bio departments. And so the questions that I ask are really rooted in the biology, but then I use models to kind of supplement um, and help understand those questions. So in this case, we looked at a model of coral algal interactions. And what we did is we said, Suppose you take some region of seabed and you can divide it into kind of three different pieces. So one piece is what's the fraction of seabed that's covered by coral? 
And so that's C. So these are all going to be fractions or proportions. What's the proportion of available seabed that's covered by macroalgae? So that's M. And so this is sort of the seaweed um, kind of high, it can grow kind of high above the reefs. And this is what ultimately really suffocates them. And then turf algae, which is essentially cropped algae. And that allows space for corals to actually recruit and, and overgrow the turf. So we looked at these three regions of seabed. And again, this is the piece where we're spatially implicit. And what that means is that we're assuming that the entire region is covered by these three things. So what that allows us to do is say, if we just look at the fraction of coral, the fraction of macroalgae, and the fra fraction of turf covering the seabed, that's going to total one. So it's the entire of the seabed. The mathematically, the kind of nice piece is that you can solve for T and just say the amount of turf can be predetermined by the amount of coral and macroalgae by just looking at one minus C minus M. So in coming up with the equations for the model, all I really have to worry about is what is the change in macroalgae with respect to time and what is the change in coral res with respect to time. So it's a series of, uh, or a system of, of differential equations that's going to model the interactions between these three pieces. And so the first piece is that we assume that uh, macroalgae is able to interact and overgrow coral. So the interactions between coral and, and uh, macroalgae is just the product M times C. And there's some rate at which macroalgae takes over. So that leads to coral mortality. So it's the negative A term. And then AMC for the macroalgae. The second term, and this is sort of the key one, is that grazing is going to, uh, the assumption is that parrotfish or whatever herbivorous fish you're looking at are gonna graze over the different algal types indiscriminately. So if they eat the algae, the turf algae, they're really just keeping it cropped. They're kind of maintaining that, that turf algae. So in terms of looking at macroalgae, we assume that the, the grazers are uh, indiscriminately looking at the amount of macroalgae and turf algae. And so for the macroalgae term, we're just looking at M over M plus T, which is the total fraction of all of the algae that's macroalgae. And it's grazed at some rate G. So again, this is kind of the key parameter is this G parameter. And we assume that once the, the grazing happens, macroalgae are cropped down to turf. Another term is that macroalgae are essentially able to grow over the turf. So if the turf is left unchecked, oops. Uh, macroalgae can grow over it at some rate gamma, so that's gamma mt. And then at some rate r, corals are able to overgrow, recruit to an overgrow turf. So that is a positive term for the, the coral dynamic. And then lastly, there's some natural cor coral mortality rate, d. So they have some natural mortality rate. Once they die, we're assumed that that space is immediately colonized by turf. And what we're left with is just this relatively simple system of nonlinear uh, differential equations. So in terms of just some results from this, um, what we want to look at is how does the coral cover actually respond when we have changes in grazing dependency? And again, this, this term right now is just some constant, but really what it depends on is how many herbivores there are in the system. So this is a, a bifurcation diagram just to kind of highlight some of the results of this. And essentially what you can look at is on the x-axis, this is the grazing intensity. So higher values mean there's more grazing. Lower value means there's, there's less grazing and presumably less fish. And then on the y-axis is the equilibrium coral cover. And so uh, here, what we have are the dash lines are unstable fixed points. This, uh, solid lines are stable. And if we look at some initial conditions, say that our initial coral cover is high, if I start with a grazing intensity that's too low, essentially the coral cover is just going to keep declining and move closer and closer to this fixed point at the bottom. In other words, there's not enough grazing to sort of keep the algae in check. The algae is all dying off, and what you're left with is this, or sorry, the coral is all dying off, um, and the algae is overgrowing it. And so what you have is the state of low coral cover, which is what we're considering the, the unhealthy state. But then you might think about management and hypothetically, maybe I'll put in some kind of marine protected area. So if I put in a marine protected area, 
hopefully the implication is that grazing intensity will shift upwards because you're having recovery of fish. And once I get past this kind of threshold um, between these different states, what will happen is you can actually have recovery. So as long as my grazing increases, I push the state over here, I can now have coral recovery. So this is a, a kind of uh, telling, I think, bifurcation diagram that shows these two different stable states of uh, healthy coral versus unhealthy coral and how grazing might play a role. And the next question um, to add to this is what are the management implications? So right now we're just treating grazing as this rate but the reality of it is that it actually depends on how many fish you have in the system. So you can build this up sort of a notch by saying, well, maybe now we can look at the fishing, the fishing dynamics by looking at the dynamics of parrotfish explicitly. So in this case, there's just some logistic growth of parrotfish minus some fishing term. So this is a catchability constant times fishing effort that's proportional to the number of fishing in the system. And then you can rewrite this grazing term so that grazing is now a function of parrotfish. So in other words, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the grazing rate is gonna increase as uh, the number of parrotfish increase. And so what we wanted to do with this is say, are we able to look at this sort of simple model of uh, parrotfish and the associated fishing dynamics to think about what fishing levels we can have to allow for recovery. And just a quick highlighting, just one of the results from this. Um, this is another similar bifurcation diagram where now I'm looking at fishing effort on the x-axis and coral cover on the y-axis. And in this case, what it shows is that coral cover has a, a stable state, a healthy stable state, as long as my fishing effort is really low. So I have sufficiently small fishing effort and my system starts in a reasonable place. In other words, if I have a completely barren coral uh, habitat where it's mostly algae, you're going to need some kind of supplement to bump the coral cover up kind of past this unstable threshold. So this was, um, again, a lot of the work I did in graduate school, but the, the question that um, I've been thinking about beyond this is how is the fishery managed over space? And so in terms of fisheries, there's a couple of things you can think about. So are they being managed by a centralized or a federal government versus a decentralized or a state government? Is there some sort of distribution of authority between these two models? Um, and how is that impacted by spillover? So in other words, if I have maybe a fishery that's partially controlled by a state government and partially controlled by a federal government, or I have two different fisheries, each determined by a different state, for example, fish are gonna to continue to swim. They might swim across these political boundaries. So this is the spillovers piece. And the question becomes, how do you optimally manage the fishery? So I'm not gonna talk about it much today because um, my, my focus has been more in the disease realm. So I'll switch focus in a second. But we did have a paper come out um, a couple of years ago, political economy of renewable resource federalism that really touch, touches on these issues of centralized versus decentralized control and what the implications are based on kind of how much heterogeneity you have in the system. So I'll just highlight that. And now I'm going to switch gears a bit. So that was sort of one of the, the motivating examples that I've, I've been interested in. The other is work that I did um, on rabies and vampire bats. So again, I'm gonna switch gears and tell a story now about, about rabies, <coughs> excuse me, and how this came to be, um, how, how the, the spatial questions came out. So this is a picture of the presence and absence of rabies in 2007. And the reason I point this out is I don't think before I started this project that I realized just how widespread rabies really is. So the orange is rabies present, the yellow is bat rabies present only, and green is where rabies is absent. And so the only place where it really seems to be absent is New Zealand. Um, it still is responsible for a, a high human toll. There's 60,000 human deaths per year. Um, and you can look at this map of the risk of requiring rabies, it's about 10 years old, but it essentially just shows where you're at high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. 
Um, and the places that are high risk require you to go and get a vaccination before you actually go visit those places. So in uh, Africa and Asia, that's where about 90% of all the rabies cases happen. And this is mostly due to transmission from dogs where they don't really have rabies uh, vaccination programs in place for dogs. In the Americas, it's skunk, raccoon, fox, and bat. And that's is where I'm gonna uh, focus my work and in particularly in Latin America. So this is a picture of a, a vampire. I hope it's nothing more from this talk. You're convinced that vampire bats are actually quite adorable. Uh, they are uh, a species in Latin America and they have colony sizes about 20 to 1,000 bats. So they're pretty small versus a, a lot of the North American bats where you have tens of thousands um, in colonies of, of brown bats, for example. So usually around 500. They slowly reproduce. So it's about one pup per female per year. And they have a pretty long lifespan. So it, their lifespan can be around 15 years. The way that they transmit rabies is through saliva. And there's two ways that this happens. So within their own species, <clears throat> it's through aggression. So if they get into a fight, they might bite the other bat. Saliva gets into the bloodstream, passes the, into the central nervous system and they can develop rabies. But the reason that they're called vampire bats is that they feed only on mammalian blood. Um, and so for interspecies transmission, the primary, the primary source of, of transmission is through feeding. And just to, to give you a couple of fun facts, uh, the vampire bat uh, needs a blood meal uh, every night and it consumes its entire body weight in blood at each feeding. And so they heavily rely on this, this source for food. And so if they go back, they're, they're social species. And if someone in their colony is having trouble, is not able to get a blood meal, they actually regurgitate the blood and feed it to their friend. So I like to tell my students about this and I tell them to think about friendship and what they might do for friends. And, and that's my example. So here's a picture of uh, a donkey that was bit uh, by a vampire bat. And what they do is they essentially go and they stalk, usually livestock in Latin America, and they have kind of razor life teeth that just make a little incision and they eat, consume the blood. In Latin America, it's a big issue because it causes around 100,000 livestock deaths per year, so 30 million US dollars. And there's still been some human deaths, and this is usually from individuals not using proper um, bug nets and so forth since 1975. The, the big thing with rabies is that there's no known cure for human rabies infection. So if a human becomes infected with rabies, once they start showing signs, there's not a known cure. There's been a couple of examples where someone has recovered, but it required things like putting them into an artificially induced coma. Um, so in general, there's no known kind of this will work type of cure. So in this work, I, I was fortunate to be able to work with some data. Um, don't worry too much about the figure on the left. But this picture is Daniel Stryker, um, who for several years went and collected these data. And essentially, he went to 17 different sites across Peru. So each of these lines is a different site. And over the course of a few years, sampled a whole bunch of bats and tested them to see whether or not they were positive or negative for rabies. So each of these pie charts essentially shows the white is the proportion that tested positive and the color is the proportion that tested negative. And, and one thing to highlight from this, by the way, that I'll, I'll bring up again, when the bats are tested, they're only tested for virus an, uh, neutralizing antibodies. And so it's only testing to see if they've been exposed. It's not necessarily known whether they'll develop an active rabies infection. And this will become important in a bit. So the findings from the data uh, are that rabies persists within the colonies each year. So when Daniel went back to each of these colonies, there was a mean of around 10.8% seroprevalence among the bats. But the, this was sort of a surprising find because the conventional wisdom is that once bats are exposed, maybe a few of them will acquire some kind of temporary immunity. So they'll get some sort of immune protection from the exposure. 
but the general thought is that it's usually highly lethal, that once you are exposed to rabies, it's, it's going to kill you, including for bats. So the question we wanted to ask is, if this is true, how is rabies maintained within the colony? So uh, in theory, if it's highly lethal, you would, you would think that in colonies that are this small, roughly 500 bats, rabies might enter the colony, kill off a couple bats and just sort of fizzle out, or it'll blow through the entire colony and just wipe out that entire colony. But instead, we're seeing kind of consistent levels of rabies year by year. So we wanted to know how is it maintained. Um, just a couple of, of quick um, consequences of this. So one, there's no spatial coordination. And again, this is getting to the issue that I'll, I'll uh, tackle at the end of the talk. Um, and so what happens is if a farmer sees that a livestock has died from suspected rabies, uh, the control is very reactive. So a lot of times they might go up, this is a picture of a suspected bat cave where it was just blown up. So they'll go and just blow up the cave. They'll also, there's programs where you catch a bat and you rub a paste on its belly and it's called vampiricide and bats participate in allo grooming. And so what happens is the bat will go back to its colony, they'll groom each other and essentially it, it makes it so that the, when the bat consumes this vampiricide, they can't digest the blood and they die by uh, starvation. So it's sort of a haphazard um, control program with not much uh, spatial coordination. So, Again, with this work, we wanted to integrate models and these data to try and understand how rabies is persisting. Um, and I'll just quickly give an overview of, of the methods. But again, I'm going to show a, a math model of the transmission dynamics within a colony. There's some unknowns in the, this model um, that we use the data to estimate, and then we think about the implications. So. The transmission model that we developed, um, and we looked at a, a few alternatives of this, and the results were actually quite consistent, is that we're using a, an SIR type model. So if you haven't seen uh, basic ideas, you take a population, divide it into compartments based on infection status. And it's, it's a nice modeling framework because you can adapt it to a lot of different types of systems. So in this case, I'll just show the, the sort of basic um, skeleton of it. The assumption is you have susceptible bats, which become exposed. So I'll show the compartmental diagram on the left and the equations on the right, if you want to see. And susceptibles become exposed to rabies at some rate, lambda, called the force of infection, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And then there's some probability that bats will either, with a probability alpha, move from the exposed class to a, a neutrally infectious class, meaning they're just not showing symptoms yet. And then the remaining will actually develop some type of temporary immunity, so one minus alpha. And again, the, the convention, the conventional wisdom is that this alpha rate, so this is dictating how many exposures lead to lethal infection, the, the common thought is that this is pretty high, that this would be pretty close to one. We assume that bats that have some kind of temporary immunity uh, can recover, go back to the susceptible class. And then we assume that the bats that develop rabies, it's sort of a two-stage process. Um, they move at some rate to this rabid class where they develop the active infection and then ultimately um, die from the disease. So this is the, the structure of the model. And there's a couple things to highlight. So one, what's the force of infection? Um, so this how bats become exposed. Essentially, there's some transmission piece between bats that are neutrally infectious and susceptible bats that are rabid uh, can infect susceptible bats. And then there's this other term, which I'm going to call an immigration term or migration term. It's really just indicating that bats can be exposed by other bats in different colonies through um, interactions outside of their, their colonies. Um, I'll skip that piece. But the samples, so I mentioned when you test the bats in the field, it's really uh, if, if a bat comes back positive, it really means that it either has some kind of temporary immunity or it's in one of these rabid classes. The samples don't differentiate between which of these two kind of variations you're in. So the unknowns that we have are the transmission rates, which I'm not gonna talk about much now, this lethal transmission probability, so the probability that you ultimately succumb to infection, and this transmission rate from immigration. So how much uh, infection is being acquired by bats interacting with bats from other colonies. 
Um, we use some statistical methods, uh, likelihood by particle filtering, and the idea is that we try to replicate the field data by simulating the model. And this is just a quick picture that I'll show very briefly, which is the, the basic idea is you plug in a parameter set, you simulate the model a bunch of times, and then, so this is the colony size over time. And where I have these red stars, this is, for example, where Daniel would have went to the field and sampled bats. What we do is sample our model. So at this point, I might say, okay, let's replicate what Daniel did in the field. He sampled 50 bats. We're gonna randomly draw 50 bats uh, from our model simulation at that point and determine which class they fall into. So jumping straight into the results, the, the results that we found were interesting and kind of counter to the, the general belief, which is here I have my lethal infection probability on the y-axis. So higher levels mean more bats die after being exposed. On the x-axis, I have some measure of immigration or interactions of bats from different colonies. And the key is that in the, the darker colors are the better parameter fits. And the key is that uh, it actually looked like there was a pretty low lethal infection probability. So most bats that are being exposed are actually developing some kind of immunity and a, relative, a relatively high level of immigration. So bats are actually interacting maybe more than, than you would think. So only 10% of exposures are lethal according to our model results. And I can just look a little bit more at, at some of what this looks like. So for example, if I take a, the parameters that are right at my, my optimum and I simulate the model, this just shows that what's happening is uh, this black curve is what the seroprevalence is over time. So I'm simulating, simulating my model. The seroprevalence is maintaining around 0.1 or 10%. So that's in line with what we were observing uh, from the field. And then the color is indicating which bats actually have some immunity that are being sampled and which are infectious. And so what's happening is that it, it according to our, our results, the majority of bats that are being sampled are likely to actually be immune rather than having an active rabies infection. And you can think about why this might not apply um, or why you might not get a similar result for other parameter combinations. So for example, if you have a really high lethal infection probability, well, what ends up happening is that you have sort of a lot of disease. Uh, you have the, the relatively high seroprevalence, but a lot of areas where there's no seroprevalence, but importantly, the population size dies out. So the, the simulation I showed before, it's actually, um, it, it stays level around 500. Here it's kind of shrinking down and by the end of our simulation, the population is, is almost gone. Uh, if immigration is low, so if there's not much interaction between the different colonies, what, it, what seems to happen is that there'll be maybe a year or so with a fair number of cases, um, which are mostly immune, but then it kind of dies out. So the takeaway from this um, is that lethal infection probability is lower than we previously thought. But for the purpose of this talk, I really wanna highlight this issue of immigration is key to persistence. And so one thing that we set up in this study was, well, spatial coordination of control efforts are really needed in order to effectively control rabies. And that's the piece um, that, again, I want to highlight, similar to what I did with the coral, which is, that's great. We can talk about spatial coordination, uh, and we can talk about, maybe from a modeling perspective, how you might consider designing some kind of control program and using models as sort of a tool to test it. But one of the issues is, is what does that spatial coordination actually look like? Um, in the example of bats, there's local farmers who manage their own land. There's uh, the government who may want to make some, excuse me, recommendations, may not. But really thinking about the interactions between the different policymakers is what I've been thinking about. So that leads me to the, the third part of the talk um, and kind of the final part, which is my more recent work over the last few years has really emphasized this issue exactly. So transboundary disease management. What does it mean to manage diseases across boundaries? Uh, and I just want to highlight this was part of a Nimbus working group on ecosystem federalism, as well as um, some work I did 
with uh, undergraduates here at Williams as part of an REU program. So the, the history of this is that we, we decided to have a working group and we called it ecological or ecosystem federalism. And if you look at just sort of the definition of federalism, what does it mean? Um, the definition of power or the distribution of power in an organization such as a government between a central authority and the constituent. And really, when we think about federalism, what we're talking about, especially for our purposes, is multiple levels of policy making and implementation. So in the US, you might think about uh, city mandates versus state mandates versus federal governments. Um, in other places, there might be different systems of government that you can think about. And again, I'll kind of come back to, to this picture that I showed in the beginning, which is that infectious diseases or fish or invasive species don't all follow uh, these ecological boundaries. They, they or the, sorry, they don't follow political boundaries. They follow more the ecological patterns. And so it's important to consider these multiple levels of governance. Uh, in our working group, we, we talked about a few things. So we, we talked about fisheries a bit, which I mentioned before. We've done some on invasive species. And again, I'm gonna focus on the infectious diseases piece. And when we started this, this was actually pre-COVID era. It's hard to think about pre-COVID era now, um, but you can actually make a lot of comparisons to COVID. And I'm, I'm not, I'm deliberately not gonna compare this to COVID explicitly, but um, you can imagine that there's been differences with, for example, uh, travel bans, who's imposing travel bans and how are they imposing travel bans? Who has been having mask mandates and who hasn't? And this could be both internationally and within the US as well. So the, the way I'm gonna consider this is by just thinking about a disease outbreak. So this is gonna be sort of a, a toy model to start to tackle some of these issues. And the, the disease outbreak that I wanna think about is just something with a high case fatality something where there's movement of humans between states or jurisdictions. So uh, in the same way that there would be dispersal of invasive species or fish, you can think about humans bringing the disease between states. And then importantly, that the populations fall under multiple administrative jurisdictions. So policy is gonna depend on how that regulation is imposed. And we are asking the question of what can we infer from it? So, it's, it's a complex problem. And so this is kind of a first pass at trying to dive into these issues. So the first is what is the governance structure? Once we identify a governance structure, we can specify management objectives because it might be the case that uh, the United States has a different objective than Canada, for example. Then we can think about the models that we wanna look at. And then finally, we can look at the consequences of, of intervention. So what types of interventions we're considering and from that take away, what are the best management actions given our different scenarios? So I'm gonna go through each piece of this. So first is governance structure. We're gonna consider a just general structure, which says we have two regions, A and B. Maybe this is state A and state B, for example. Each of these states has its own local authority. And in this model, we're gonna assume that the local authority is only thinking about itself. It's, it's acting selfishly, in other words. It doesn't care about what's happening in state B or region B. It just wants to know what's happening in my own region and what control should I impose to make it better for myself. The second layer of this is a federal authority. So in the case of the federal authority, we're assuming that there's some government um, US government or uh, another federal government that can also impose some guidelines or some policies. But what we're gonna assume is that it sort of is required to give a one size fits all approach. In other words, it has to be fair, so to speak, between regions A and B. So it's gonna give kind of the same level of vaccination or whatever control you might think about. And then third, there's a coordinating authority. And so the coordinating authority is what we're kind of thinking of a, as a first best, so to speak, and that the coordinating authority is gonna work with both states and figure out what is the best for the overall good. So that's kind of the underlying structure. And again, just local is gonna act selfishly and it's also gonna assume the neighbor does nothing. National authority is this one size fits all. 
And then the coordinating authority is this first best. And one other thing that we're doing, at least in, in this piece, is assuming that just one level of government acts. So only the local, federal, or coordinating authority. The second thing we're gonna do is specify the management objectives. And in terms of disease as an example, you might consider two different objectives. So one government, government might say, I really wanna follow the number of cases and I wanna make sure that there are not, that there's fewer cases uh, or as few cases as possible. Another constituent might say, uh, or authority might say, no, what we care about is death. So we really wanna minimize the number of deaths. This is a, a disease that causes a lot of mortality. So now we have our governance structure and our two different management objectives. So we can think about a model. And again, I'm gonna use an SIR type model. Um, so I showed you the, the schematic with the bats a while ago. Um, but in this case, we're just assuming that in one region, so I'm just looking at region A, for example, uh, we have an SIRS framework. So in other words, susceptibles become infected through interaction with individuals who are infected. There's some recovery rate, gamma, and some, uh, some disease-induced mortality rate, M. So they recover at rate gamma and move into the recovered class, or they ultimately um, die because of the disease. And then we assume that after they're recovered, they can become susceptible again. So they leave the, the recovered class, move back into the susceptible. The next piece is that now we wanna think about space explicitly. So each of these classes now has some dispersal term. So for example, in my S equation, um, Delta AB is just indicating how many individuals from the other location, region B, are, or the rate at which those individuals are entering location A, and it's proportional to, to S. And then we have some fraction that are leaving. And so we do that for each of our terms. And now what we can do is couple that with our model for uh, between the two regions. So region A and B each have an SIRS type model and each of them is connected by dispersal. We have our model. Now we can consider what types of controls we might wanna look at. One of them is vaccination. So vaccination, we just say, okay, there's some fraction of individuals who might, or at some rate, will go right from susceptible to recovered. We also assume a second control of quarantine. So if an individual is detected with having disease, they move to a quarantine class and then ultimately go directly from there to recover. We look at medication and there's different ways to look at medication. Um, in our case, we're assuming that it essentially speeds up the recovery time. So the rate at which you move from infected to recovered is faster than it would be otherwise. And then lastly, we consider two different types of, uh, of travel bans. So the first type is what I'm calling a complete travel ban. And what this is, is that state B is saying, I'm not going to let, uh, sorry, state A is saying that they're not gonna let individuals from state B enter state A. So they're imposing a travel ban that's not letting individuals come into their, their state, but they can still leave. And then the second is a partial travel ban, which says, if you're infected, you can't come in to our state. Um, this is, of course, you know, ideal. Ideally, you would know everyone who's infected and you could um, impose such a, such a restriction, uh, such, excuse me, such a restriction, but in reality, you can't tell if everyone's infected. So this is kind of an, an uh, imperfect type of uh, control. So now that we have that, we can think about what are the consequences of interventions and what is the best management action. And again, the, what I really want to get to the heart of is how does this governance structure play a role? So first thing, I can look at just local authority. So let's assume that just the local authority is making a decision. We're not paying, there's not a difference between management effect, uh, objectives. So in this case, what ends up being interesting is that we have a typical control ranking where it's vaccination kind of performs the best, medication the second best, quarantine the third best, but then in fourth you have no control and in fifth and sixth you have the travel ban. What that implies is that the travel ban is actually making things worse. So here's a, a just um, representation of these results. So 
if only state A acts, this plot, this first one shows what happens in state A. So state A, the on the x-axis, this is how much control there is. So uh, what's my vaccination rate, my medication rate, things like that. The horizontal line at one indicates what would happen if there was no control. So in other words, if I look at uh, vaccination, for example, this purple line, what this is doing is saying if I impose vaccination, it's making a huge drop in either the number of cases or, or number of deaths. Relatively speaking, the travel bans are still creating a decrease in the number of cases relative to the no control case, but not as substantial. However, if I then look at my, my second state, so the left is state A, the middle is state B, what happens is that the state B kind of benefits from having vaccination in the other country. So even though they're not doing anything in their country or state, uh, they're still kind of getting the benefits, but the travel ban is actually making there, there be more cases. And the idea here is that you're essentially taking a smaller community and not letting the disease kind of fizzle out um, with having more individuals in it. It's kind of confined to this smaller group of individuals and the number of cases actually goes up. And then if you total over both states, what you end up with is that the travel bans actually are worse than doing nothing at all. So uh, this is a, a, was a surprising and interesting result on the state management level. At the federal level, so <coughs> excuse me, uh, thinking about now doing a one size fits all approach, the travel ban actually had minimal impact. So it, it didn't necessarily do harm, but it also didn't really help. And in this case, the, the key takeaway was that the objectives mattered much more. So am I minimizing cases or deaths? So here are the, the typical control rankings for this. So the, when I say typical control rankings, I just mean we tried out kind of different initial conditions, different levels of control, things like that. If I'm trying to minimize cases, my best bet is vaccination. And so what that's doing is moving individuals into the recovered class really fast so it's it's preventing cases from happening in the first place. Whereas if my goal is to minimize deaths, my uh, preferred control options are medication and quarantine. And so in this case, you're assuming, you know, I'm not minimizing the number of cases, but if there is a case, I want to make sure do, that I do everything I can to prevent mortality. The last piece that I'll just show briefly is what happens if you have a coordinating authority. And the idea here is that both states A and states B are interacting. So this left has the objective of minimizing cases, right has the objective of minimizing deaths. And what this looks at is on state A, they might choose an option such as a complete travel ban, for example. State B might also choose a complete travel ban and you end up with this gray square. The color map is saying how well or, or not good it's doing compared to no control. So no control would be at one, which is gray. So here it's gray, it basically says, eh, it's not really doing much. Where it's blue, those are the, the controls that are working the best. And then red is sort of where it's doing um, better with no control. The, the main thing for this is just to say, if you coordinate, it's, it's sort of a plea for cooperation. If, if, if states are willing to cooperate on the results, you can actually look at and identify what is the best uh, combination based on local conditions. Um, and one thing I'll also mention is that uh, contrary to what we saw with the state only control, um, travel bans can be effective. And in this case, when travel bans were effective, it was only at the beginning of an epidemic. So in terms of, it, so it's effective in uh, preventing the establishment of an epidemic to begin with. So some ongoing work from this, um, I've been working to uh, apply this to particular systems. So there's some things right now that are, are simplifications for the purpose of let's just get a broad picture of what these questions are and how we might think about them. Um, but now, for example, we wanna think about a uh, particular system. So, so applying it to, for example, a specific disease or a specific invasive insect. Um, also thinking about management costs. So right now, the, the model that I looked at just looks at 
outcomes. It doesn't consider the actual cost of, impl of implementation. And of course, there's going to be restrictions and, and limitations on what those costs are and what budgets are. And then also, what about multiple managers acting simultaneously? So can you kind of have states doing their own thing with some supplemental um, federal kind of centralized uh, management? The, the thing that I, I really want to highlight, though, um, in this case was, you know, the uh, acting selfishly can harm the overall good, so the travel bans can make things worse. Objectives may matter. But really, in, in all of this work, if you're asking questions about management, it's important to consider the ecological and political boundaries, because if you, uh, like a lot of my work did before, when you just consider an implicitly spatial model, you're not considering these differences. And there's importance to that, and it, it's valuable. Um, but considering the political boundaries can presumably uh, really change maybe what your, your current thought is. So I will wrap up there, um, and I have a lot of thanks. Uh, so the Nimbus Working Group, um, individuals that I've worked with on the coral reefs, my, my small undergraduates, and my work on vampire bats. And with that, I will wrap up and I'm happy to take any questions. Yay, if you can hear there's some people clapping right now in person. <laughs> Other people are clapping online. Um, I will, I don't see any questions right now, um, but as a reminder for people online, you can post your questions um, or you can raise your hand if you would choose to do that. Um, I'll wait a second, but I have some questions before people dive in themselves. Um, again, that was an awesome talk. I really liked your heat map figure that you just showed like a couple slides back showing those. Oh, thanks. Uh, the actions and comparing. Yeah, that was, that was really cool. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I guess my first question going back to the beginning of your talk when you talked about coral reefs and it was like parrotfish. Mm -hmm. We had um, that one management equation in your differential equation where you had minus something EP, if you remember. Yeah, that. sorry, I'm, I, I hope I'm not oh, no, no. much of a strobe show yes, over right there. there. That's perfect. I was wondering if you thought about whether or not like, or I don't know anything about per fish like um, removal and um, whatnot, but I'm wondering if effort is like nonlinear to the population too. Like if population was like super low, if you like kind of dealt with that stock effect and if so, like would your results change, do you think? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, so this is sort of like a, a standard kind of economic-based model where you have this catchability coefficient in the effort level. Um, there are certainly many different assumptions you can make. And one, one big one that I'll say um, is also trophic interactions. And so this model just considers a single species, a single catch rate. Um, this tends to be, I think, a, a starting place for this stuff. What I looked at, I did not consider nonlinear um, catch here, and presumably it would um, impact this diagram. Um, it might actually make things look a little flatter here is probably my guess, kind of make things a little worse off. Um, what I did play around a little bit with is how this grazing function actually relates to parrotfish. So I didn't change the fishing, I just kept it constant. Um, but looked at different functional forms for the grazing term. Um, and I also looked at uh, changing the dependence of this carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity, right now it's fixed, but it might also depend on things like habitat quality. Um, for all of the things I tested, this doesn't directly answer your question, because the I guess the, the short answer is I have not tried that. Um, but in most of the things that I, I did try, you essentially get something kind of structurally similar, but it it changes the qualitative shape. Um, and I, I think it's something where there's actually a lot more room to do uh, studies that would be more directly tied to data, for example. Yeah, 
Cool. That's great. Um, there's another question about your SIR model with rabies. So that might be before you went into the management, um, the transboundary management. It was uh, your second part, I believe. Um, question is, um, whether or not the bats, do they always stay rabid? Like they don't go back to that, they never get cured, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so they, um, so it, once once it crosses into the, the central nervous system, um, they never are cured. That being said, I did test a couple of alternative models that I think I actually have at the end. Uh, yeah, so we did look at a couple of alternatives, which were um, in this one, uh, this is the original. So we looked at either temporary or lifelong immunity. Um, we did look at an example with recovery from infection. So we did look at, at this one, um, which I think is what the question is about, where maybe you have some fraction that actually are able to acquire immunity. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's actually been documented if that could happen, but we tested it and estimated this parameter, um, this basically what would be a fraction of individuals that can go into the immunity class and recover. And it, it turns out it didn't make a difference. Um, the results actually stayed the same. And while I'm on that, I'll say we also looked at an immune boosting model. So if you have subsequent exposures, exposures the, the same thing happened. Cool, yeah, thanks. Um, so another question is, it's a silly one, what is the body weight of those vampire bats? Because you said that they drink their entire body weight a day. So how much is that exactly? It's, it's not, a, they're tiny. Um, so the picture I have, I think it's like just a few ounces. Um, right, right. Sorry, I'm just, you know, making you flash through all of these slides. Uh, but so this picture, for example, um, the bat is actually being held in a baseball glove and it's only kind of taking up like the three fingers of the baseball glove. So it gives you a sense of kind of how small they are. But yeah, they're they're quite tiny. And okay. it, so there was actually, a, this was a number of years ago now, um, I don't know if they followed up, but they tried to do some GPS tracking of the bats and they couldn't find a tracker that was light enough to not just weigh them down in flight. <laughs> man they are very cute though <laughs> they are cute i usually show some babies but i guess i i got rid of the babies for some reason um i have a, another question i'm wondering about your future work with the trans boundary management um kind of that side of the talk i'm wondering um if you're if you're going to think about how the spatial structure of the two regions or maybe more regions and potentially like whether or not if one region was like larger than the other how would that kind of impact um your results too i'm just curious about that yeah um i have not done that yet the main thing that i've done for now is we've been looking at um two sort of very different diseases and actually putting the optimal control on top of it um, to think about costs and stuff. And it's the tricky thing is there's a lot of moving parts with it. So there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, my guess is there's some disease work out there on like um, kind of central source populations where maybe are, they're bigger like commuting cities. So there's a lot of movement going in and out of them. And so my guess is that would have a big impact on travel bans um, and maybe be, you could probably highlight cases where they would be much more important um, versus detrimental, which I showed. So it's a good question. I haven't done it, but that would be what I what I guess. Yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, I was wondering, because I've read a little bit of um, work on that with uh, emerald ash borers, with oh, yeah. forestry work, with private public um, forest. Um, I'm sure you've came across that with your research yeah. as well. Yeah, very cool. That's a that's a interesting system that a lot of this would apply to, I think. Yeah. I don't see any more questions, um, but it's uh, time's up now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, thanks again so much, Julia, for your talk. It was really informative and um, yeah, it was a great talk to listen to. So thanks for uh, being yeah, willing thanks to have me. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Well, hope you have a great weekend and everyone else online, hope you have a great weekend as well. Thanks. Right. Bye.